Um, <clears throat> with my other hat on, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Turi. Turi, are you here? Hooray. Um, have you got a mic on? You can have this one. I will just quickly introduce you as the founder of Pali, um, an encyclopedia for opinion. Thank you very much, Cassie. <laughs> thank you. Th Cassie, thank you. Okay, so I was asked to present to, pr to produce a gigantic bundle of slides for this presentation, which I did. I mean, so many pictures. Look, right? right thank you. I'm going to move on from Nigel. Um, I produce so many slides, but the reason I'm showing them to you is that I hate talking to slides. Actually, should we just stick with that one? Because that one's, that one's kind of great. Um, talking of encyclopedias of opinion. So I'm, I'm actually just going to talk to you, and if you want to see the slides, then I can share with them, them with you in hard copy later. Um, so I, I'm going I'm to just tell you the story of this kind of absurd idea, which is to try and build um, an encyclopedia of all opinion. Um, not, no hubris or grand delusions here. Um, I, I'm, I'm, this starts sort of in 2016. So 2016 is the year when we all turn around and realize that political consensus is shot. We have what we have here, which we remember. We have what we have in America, which we remember. In Italy, there's another uh, referendum, a constitutional referendum, which also goes in a very peculiar way to the extent that two years later you have two people on direct opposite sides of the spectrum trying to run the country simultaneously. Um, and the, but the aftermath of 2016, I'm thinking particularly of Brexit in the UK, was a lot of media organizations asking themselves, what did we get so wrong? How do we fail to understand what was going on here? Are we representing the people that we're supposed to be talking about and talking to? Exactly the same conversations happened in the US after Trump was elected. Um, and this spun up an enormous discourse, extremely valuable and critical that we continue around fake news, around notions of post-truth, around the evils of postmodernism, for having invented the, relativi re the relativism which brings around this post-truth era, misinformation, disinformation, and the rest of it, all of which is true, and all of which is critical for us to cover. My reaction to, um, to Brexit, probably because there's an element of psychosis here, was, um, why am I continually having the same arguments with everybody over and over again? We must have spilt billion, billions, maybe more, words on Brexit in the build-up to the referendum in, on TV, in the newspapers, um, in pubs, over Christmas lunch. And um, by the time we got to the referendum, I kind of thought that I and anybody I knew could probably write down the reasons that people were going to vote leave or going to vote remain on the back of an envelope in about 10 minutes. I'm being reductive. But broadly, that was the realization that hit me. And as I started thinking about this, I thought, hang on, if in fact there's actually a limited number of arguments and opinions around something as profound, huge, complex, and talked about as Brexit, is that the same thing with everything? Is it the same thing with the debate around euthanasia, around abortion, around whether Trump should buy Greenland, around, um, <laughs> around whether Cristiano Ronaldo is a better footballer than Lionel Messi? Um, and it turns out that the answer is yes. The answer is there is a finite number of arguments Finite in a useful sense. Philosophically, there's an infinite number. But honestly, in a finite, but in a, in a pra practical way, there's a, not just a finite number of arguments around any given issue, but a crazy limited number of arguments around any issue. So if I reckon, again, I'm slightly exaggerating, that we could all sit down and write the five reasons that people voted leave or the five pe reasons that people voted remain, if you look at the debate around abortion, which we've spent a bit of time looking at, broadly, there are two or three tracks across that and you get to pretty much covering the entire debate very, very fast. Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi is much more complicated. But, um, but that was the core realization, that actually there is a limited number of arguments about everything. And so if there's a limited number of arguments about everything, theoretically, you can map them. 
So that's my starting point. Again, no delusions of grandeur, no hubris, no thinking I'm God and everything else. I spent um, a couple of months with a brilliant um, NLP genius trying to work out whether we could get um, the beginnings of AI to do some of this work for us. And this was 2016. And the answer then was, uh -uh, no way, and also not helpful. And I didn't understand what he was talking about for most of the time. So I stopped and gave up. And then. About four months later, I was in Portugal and met a very morose Portuguese philosopher um, and thought, yay, partner, um, and spent three months trying to do, go through the philosophy with him um, and ended up being sort of as morose as he was. I'm sure he's happy and no longer talking to me as well. Um, and then, so finally I thought to myself, actually, this is not a philosophy problem. There are issues around taxonomy, which I can talk about. Um, and this is not quite yet an AI solution. Um, but this is a design, this is a design challenge. How do you map the arguments around Brexit in such a way that they're going to be profoundly exciting, surprising, informative um, to a very, very large number of people in a way which also, and there's the politics here for me, in a way which also suggests that they might look at the one which isn't the one that they hold. Because at the back of this, for me, is partly the, the, the challenge, the intellectual challenge of seeing whether one can map this. But actually, more than this, there's a very basic political core to what I'm trying to achieve, which is broadly, in a, in a period which I think it's fair to say is determined by information surplus. We have far, 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 far more information at our fingertips than we ever had before. In a period which has been beautifully described by a, by a political and social scientist called Will Davis as a period of feeling of nervous states where we are, in a sense, reducing our rationality and relying more and more on the feelings that we have about things. Is there value in trying to spin up a kind of an accelerant to the conversations? So what I'm really trying to do with Pali is essentially three things. One, I'm trying to help people, starting with me, figure out what I actually think about these giant issues floating around on a daily basis. I'm trying to help everybody, starting with me, understand that the people on the other side, on the multiple other sides of the argument, are sincere. They believe what they say. There are reasons for them having those opinions, which I think is fundamental in today's um, slightly fractured public sphere. And the third thing I'm trying to do is, I think, just accelerate the conversation. Every time there's a school shooting in the US, Twitter lights up like a Christmas tree with arguments which we've all read a billion times before. The interesting thing here is that if you ask, and we've looked at a bunch of the research, if you ask people who are against gun rights, who are the gun control gang, um, what they think the motivations are for the gun rights people, the ones who are the, NR, the NRA crowd, the view there would be is, is often they've got to be in it for something else. Perhaps they're being paid by the NRA. Perhaps there's some other ulterior motive. They, one side can't believe the sincerity of the other. So that's one. That's that's the other thing that I'm trying to I'm trying to deal with. So, how long do I have left, by the way? Um, so I'm actually going to use another slide. Yay. Um, so the big, the big challenge for, for us has been how do we design this in such a way as to make it appealing to a large, large number of people? So as a starting point, given what I've just described to you, my sense was it's, this is easy. My go-to-market is based around a specific kind of user behavior, and that user behavior is people who are really interested in the other side of the argument and want to have their own opinions challenged. Turns out that, that user behavior does not exist. Um, so, um, so as I started thinking about this, I was like, okay, well, that's the end of that business, and I'm going to start something else, and to hell with public discourse, and there's got to be other things to be done. Um, it occurred to me that there was potentially another way of looking at this. Um, and. Um, I have been enormously helped by your previous speaker earlier today, Sarah, um, to think about the ways in which we actually do take this to market. So I'm, I'm going to give you my underlying thesis so that afterwards or in questions you can destroy it or 
tell me how it could be improved. But the, my, my, my fundamental thesis from a go-to-market perspective, how do I take this idea, how do I take this quite abstract argument map and take it out to large numbers of people? My sense is that um, the internet is a giant, giant library, an enormous catalog. If you Google my name, you'll get a pretty shoddy LinkedIn profile. Um, if you Google the 1848 revolutions, you'll end up with mm, some really interesting Wikipedia articles. If you Google music, you'll end up in one of the music catalogs, Spotify's Pandora's. If you're Googling books, Amazon, etc., Goodreads. Giant catalogs of information which Google serves as the uh, query, the entry point into. There is a giant, giant swathe of uh, questions, a particular type, type of question, which I don't think has got a catalog for it. And it's the open opinion question. Does God exist? Who the hell is Greta Thunberg? Um, what caused the US defeat in Vietnam? These, these, these open questions which um, people ask of Google hundreds and hundreds of millions of times a month. Um, and so where I hope we are taking this is into what has historically been called, the, the Q, I suppose, the Q&A space. So Q&A, those chat fora, was sort of where the internet started, open-ended discussions, etc. It's then disrupted, I suppose, by things like Yahoo Answers, and then disrupted again 10 years ago now by Quora, with its very particular approach to answering these questions. Single authored, upvoted, not particularly peer reviewed, etc. What I'm hoping is that we're able to, by aiming towards definitiveness, so when you ask the question, does God exist, Pali needs to answer all the opinions around God's existence. Yes, no, maybe, etc. If we can do that in a way which is definitive, which is peer reviewed, um, which is concise and which is informative, our hope is that we can bubble up into that, into that space uh, and become a media platform, a big media platform. How are we going to produce this? Because building a giant opinion platform is not a bad enough idea to start with, um, I'm hoping to be able to build this with a community. So um, what I'm hoping is that there is a large enough group of people on the internet who like shouting at each other, um, some of whom you will have met in your comments pages, um, uh, who risk being interested in contributing to this knowledge project. So, um, so that's what we're trying to do there. It'll be, from a content perspective, augmented by the work that is now starting to happen with the natural language processing, which I told you about, which was three years ago, was nowhere now really is. Um, we're working with the universities of Sussex and, and Liverpool to try and work out whether we can cluster arguments using natural language processing on the internet and f field them back into, into Pali. Um, and um, I can tell, maybe I should, maybe, if that's okay, I might stop there um, and, and open up to questions. Before I, oh my goodness, um, before I do open up to questions, I also have a couple of requests, um, and they're both for humans. We are just in the process of launching, and I'm looking for a spectacular editor slash community manager who wants to come in and drive all our content, content strategy, the content that we're building, et cetera, et cetera, um, at any stage in their career. And I'm also looking for um, a mini, mini Sarah um, uh, to help us drive audience, uh, audience engagement. Thank you very much for listening to me. That was completely fascinating, so okay, that's the sorry. first thing I'm going to say. Um, okay, so I've got two questions, am I allowed to? You touched on the first one already, but you know, um, we know that all the research shows that you know, emotions and identity are what drives kind of decision-making, not kind of arguments um, based on evidence. So how do you feed that into these kind of, yeah, how do you feed that into the encyclopedia and is that part of it and how, you know, how does that work? Because surely that could be more or less finite, you can't have less finite, but that could be potentially infinite. Um, and secondly, you 
slightly touched on this too, but um, how do you, you know, even if, given, say, you do have a finite number of arguments, those, the, how that's framed or so on could vary enormously depending on your background, who you, who you are, where you're from. Like, how do you ensure that like, true diversity in the opinions being um, represented on the site? And are you seeking to, uh, uh, and, and, and similarly in terms of the questions, you know, so are they going to be more focused on questions of interest to a Western audience or is it going worldwide? I guess that was kind of three questions, sorry. Can I answer it like it's one? question um, and then maybe they'll sort of open it up and if I haven't answered it, it's because it was too complicated for me to remember um, but um, what I think you're talking about is a thing which keeps me and my partner so my partner who I wish was here this evening is a designer so rather than finding I, of all the various different functions that I thought was critical to bring on um, I brought on a designer because I think there are you 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 you, you alluded to them without telling me directly there are giant ethical challenges around the whole of this thing so there are ethical challenges around representation there are ethic i mean so who's represented whose opinions are represented how we render those things the language that we use for them there are ethical challenges around this is the this on some level this is the worst idea in the world i'm platforming terrible ideas do 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 does do vaccines give you autism uh-huh yes some people think they do and there's enough people out there for me on Pali to think it's critical that those ideas are surfaced. Did the Holocaust ever happen? Uh-huh, there are lots and lots and lots of people who don't think that it ever happened. We need to be rendering these. I am not, I don't want Pali to be um, prescriptive, it needs to be descriptive. And so where we set the borders, where we set the boundaries for what counts as descriptive, what counts, what, what is justified to appear on the site is gonna be a super tricky thing to do. So I, I think I'm just telling you that I am faintly aware of some of the wasp's nests I'm walking into, but I don't have the answers to that. Um, specifically to your point about bringing on multiple different viewpoints, I remembered your first question as well, on the multiple different viewpoints. It's one of the great disasters that most of these Q&A sites have had, or even actually participatory content sites. So Wikipedia, as we know, is 99.73% white males, like me, unfortunately. Um, Reddit is not entirely dissimilar. Um, the last big startup that I founded was a photojournalism network. We must have been 95% male. Um, so how do we bake in an approach from a design perspective which tries to preempt some of the problems that we're, that we're facing? And I'm, I'm talking to very, very brilliant female Wikipedians about, for example, about how to deal with that. So there's, we've got a big problem there, or we've got a challenge there, how do we deal with that? We'll see. Um, your, your first question, which was around uh, the feeling stuff. I think there are two parts to this. The first was, Tori, do not build a website based on trying rationally to change people's minds about stuff, because not a, no use case. Um, the second, the, the, I suppose another way of thinking about this is, if feeling and if group identity and if um, appurtenance or belonging or negative definitions of self are critical to the way people formulate opinion, we need to be looking at that. Potentially it's also super interesting information. So when you go to, does God exist on Pali? Today you just have a bunch of positions and arguments. But what you may end up having is, in this geography, turns out that Pew Labs, the Pew, Pew, Pew research, tells us that 73% of people do, and 20, I can't do the math, something less than that don't. Um, and um, so we have some metadata as well around the kind of content that we're producing. I think I'll stop there. Time for one more. Hello, it's me again, I'm sorry. Um, you sort of answered my initial question past that, but I, it raised lots of fascinating ones because you're obviously like absolutely slightly terrified of what you're about to do, which you should be, because it's terrifying. We just had, we just had, for instance, a survey about Boris Johnson, um, and 22% of people trust Boris Johnson. I'm pretty sure all those people trust Boris Johnson because they agree with him because he's a proven liar continuously. Like there's there's loads of evidence. I mean, it, it's 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 absolutely true. This appears to be to some extent, trying to tackle our polarisation issue, yet you're going to get a lot of opinions on here that are just adding to polarisation. Because, and I get that your idea is that these things should just be out there and they should be mappable. Is your purpose to actually tackle polarisation or map 
polarization because if it's it's a, if it's a data harvesting exercise i really want to know why those crazy 22 percent of people think boris johnson tells the truth i really want to know but that's not a community engagement that they should really be doing willingly because they are they are, they are pawns in that whereas if it's an attempt to actually like host opinions how does this actually challenge the polarization that is basically destroying great question. really up? really gr great question if i got three three minutes i'm gonna i'm gonna answer it in there, there are two things to touch on. Um, I also am absolutely fascinated by the reasons that people think things. Um, and so phase two of this entirely unlikely project is trying to work out how we can get our audience to start giving us information about the things that they think and how it works. Basically, I'm, 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 I'm jealous. I think there's a gap in the market now that Cambridge Analytica is dead. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, so, so can we, and I'm, we, I, we're working with a bunch of quite interesting academics on this, can we begin to look at what the hidden premises, the multiple hidden premises are for the opinions that people verbally render? There's a fabulous um, evolutionary psychologist Called, um, called Jonathan Haidt, Haidt, Haidt um, who has written a book called The Righteous Mind. And his line is that our decisions, our opinions, should be thought of as a mahout on top of an elephant. That our rational mind is the mahout with the stick, and our gut, our stomach, is the elephant. Eh, most of the time, the elephant wins. The mahout gives the impression of being able to direct things in certain ways, but if the elephant's going in a particular direction, nothing's going to stop him. So actually, a vast majority, in my case, almost all my opinions come from my stomach, not from my brain. Um, and so looking at how that works, I think is going to be a fundamental part of this project. Polarization, mapping it, or fixing it. I start this business, this idea, with a sort of a single belief, which is, and this really is a belief, this is not justifiable rationally, that um, shining a light really does work and that the best ideas do win out in a battle of, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a context, in a, in a contest. Um, but fundamentally, that's, that starts from a, a, a one premise higher up, which is that um, we need to be going back into the rational to be able to settle, to be able to build a consensus upon which to disagree. So I am fully for the breakdown in consensus, because consensus very often is just another word for groupthink. And we are not in a historical period where we can afford to get away with the kind of thinking we've been doing for the last 20 years since the, end of the, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. We need new ideas who are completely different kinds of challenges. What I'm trying to do is to, what I want to do is to surface these all up so that they can be played out and fought through in a way which risks leading to answers. I'm trying to take the emotions out so that we can build a consensus based on rationality. That was pompous. I'm so sorry to end with such something so wildly pompous. Thank you all for listening to me. <laughs>